Today's first scripture reading comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 7, and this is from the Passion Translation. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's own achievements, nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame or disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. This is the word of the Lord. So we are currently in a sermon series called The Liturgies That Form Us. And the term liturgy is most familiar in a church context, but we're considering it in a broader context to include all the patterns and habits of our everyday lives. So this could include the things we do first thing in the morning when we get up, scrolling on our phones at a stoplight, using a predictable bedtime routine for our children. The things that we repeatedly do matter. They shape and form us and bring purpose and meaning to our days. In this series, we've been looking at some of the historic Christian practices and how and why they are relevant for us today in 2020, even in the midst of a global pandemic. The liturgies we've looked at in this series haven't been chosen at random, but because they are ones that Jesus himself engaged in while he was on earth as a way of connecting to God, his Father. Copying what Jesus did and engaging in these spiritual practices will help us know and connect more fully with God as well. Today, we're going to focus on the liturgy or spiritual practice of community, which is one of my favorites. Um, community is something I personally value deeply, and I'm grateful to be part of a church that values it as well. It's even in our name. But what exactly do we mean by community? It's a word that's tossed around a lot in culture today, and community exists in lots of forms and in lots of places. It could be a group of people with a common interest, like a running club, or it could be people who share a common space, like a cul-de-sac or a neighborhood or a classroom community. So people united by common interests or proximity do fit one definition of community, but they don't quite get at the distinctives of what Christian community is intended to be. So I turned to Google, which is one of our cultural liturgies of what we do when we don't know things. So I found a definition there that does get a little bit closer. Google defined community as a group of diverse, interdependent organisms growing or living together in a specified habit. So if you were here with us this morning, I would ask you to take a look around and see who is sitting with you in here in the pavilion. If you're at home and you're with somebody, take a look around the room. We are a group of really different people and we are living, to grow, living and growing together in the specified habit of Community West Church in West Richmond. This particular definition highlights diversity, inter interdependence, and growth. And these are the things that scripture talks about relative to community as well. Our call to worship highlighted that God himself exists in relationship within the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit created humans in their image as relational beings. Jesus models community for us as part of the Trinity, and he also modeled it for us in, during his time on earth in his relationships with the disciples who are certainly a diverse and eclectic bunch. So looking around again here at Community West, many of us have chosen to be part of this particular church because we feel connected in some way to the people who are here. We might enjoy being together, and some of us have even felt like we fit or belong. This is wonderful and good, and that is what church community should feel like. My hope is that we all experience loving and being loved here, and my hope is that we will keep moving towards loving and being loved more so that there is room and space for everyone in that community. True community in Christian terms goes beyond the warm and fuzzies and also requires a bit more. To be the community that Jesus calls us to be, 
one that is fiercely committed to seeing in people and communities transformed by the love of Christ, means that we ourselves are also committed to being transformed by Christ's love. And one of the ways that we are transformed is through our life together. How we see each other and how we relate to one another matters and it forms us. For those of you who were here last week, Gailey's prayer repeatedly highlighted the contrast between how things are in this world and how they are intended to be in the kingdom of God. The ways of the kingdom are not the ways of this world. The ways we are invited to interact with each other and be in community might feel unfamiliar or unexpected or even countercultural, and that is because they are. This is what Paul is drawing our attention to in the early part of Ephesians chapter 4. So Ephesians is a really rich book, and I learned a lot about it preparing for this sermon. Our time is pretty short, so I'm just going to highlight a few things that might give a little more context to our text. So first, Ephesians is an epistle, which means that it is a letter that was written to a particular group of people at a particular time. What's a little bit different about Ephesians is that it is not specifically addressed to any individuals. No one particular is greeted in this letter as they are in other ones. This letter was broadly intended to be passed around to all of the churches in the area. So New Testament scholars now look at Ephesians especially as a letter that is intended for the church universal. It is written as a guide to navigating life in light of the gospel. It outlines what is different for believers because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Another thing that really piqued my interest was that Paul is writing this letter from prison. He is in an isolated, difficult space that has no immediate end in sight. This is not entirely dissimilar from the place we find ourselves this summer with the COVID crisis. It was strangely comforting to me that this letter is written by a person who understands what it's like to be human in a difficult space. But Paul wrote with great hope and encouragement for us. What was most deeply true for Paul in the midst of his circumstances is what is also most deeply true of us in the midst of ours as well. And that truth is that we are in Christ. Paul uses that phrase 36 times in the book of Ephesians. It's repeated because it's important. The first three chapters of Ephesians explain what this means and recap the gospel story for us. Jesus came to rescue us before we knew we needed it. We receive salvation by faith, and because of his grace, we have a new identity in Christ. Ephesians was written to Jews and Gentiles who had nothing to do with each other prior to Jesus. When Jesus came... He broke the division between them. It was no more, and they were united as one family in Christ. This is true for each of us as well. Our truest identity and reality is that we are in Christ. Our in Christness means that unity is possible in difference and that we can relate to each other in freedom. Chapter 3 ends with Paul praying for the believers that we would be given knowledge and experience of the incredible goodness, generosity, mercy, and grace of Jesus. He prays that we would be rooted and established in this truth, implying that that specific reality cannot be shaken by our feelings, our circumstances, our fears, or our insecurities. This reality, this being in Christ, is ours to live into and enjoy. Would you pray with me as we continue exploring this passage together? Jesus, we thank you that we are in Christ. We thank you for what that means, and we thank you for the ways that your spirit will help us know further what that means. God, would you give us capacity to hear and understand your call to community and what that looks like for each of us in this particular community as well. Amen. I'm going to reread just verses 1 to 3 for us from Ephesians chapter 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So when I first read this, the word worthy kind of set off some alarm bells in my head because I have some background in a pretty legalistic church, so that sort of screamed to me themes of earning or measuring up. But that's not what Paul means, so if you're having that same response, hang in there, there's some good news for all of us here. Paul's urge for us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling is first and foremost a call to move. Going back to our trusty Google again, one definition of walk was to pursue a course of action or a way of life. This is the kind of walking that Paul is inviting us to. We're not being asked to perform in a certain way to measure up or to prove our worth, but rather we get to walk in this way and take on this way of life because of what Jesus has done. 
Jesus has broken down the dividing walls between us. He has made it entirely unnecessary for us to justify ourselves or make a place for ourselves. As believers, we already belong, and there's always room for more people in this family. We don't have to be right all the time or take care of ourselves because we belong to God and we belong to each other. This passage goes on to describe how we practice living as those who are in Christ, how we act like citizens of the kingdom with each other now, even while we still wait for Christ's eventual return and the restoration of all things. Living in community now means that we seek to engage each other with the things this passage talks about, with all humility and gentleness, with patience and bearing with one another in love. Living in community in these ways is about practicing the unity of the spirit that already exists among us. In his book, The Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster talks about community in a chapter entitled The Discipline of Submission. There's another one of those words that does not sit well with most of us. But what I liked about this chapter was he referred to each discipline having a corresponding freedom. And for community, he defined that as the ability to lay down the terrible burden of always needing to get our own way. The discipline of community helps us to lay aside our selfishness and to prevent us from becoming entirely self-centered. But it is so difficult, especially when we feel convinced that we're right and we feel justified in our criticism of or anger towards another. Humility is no joke and it involves risk, but there's also potential for learning and growth in greater community and deeper love. So for those of you who don't know, I work at a church, not this one, but a larger one in town with about 25 people on staff. With the staff that large, there's a way to easily gravitate towards people who I'm comfortable with, who are easy to be with. But there's also people who are not easy for me. And there's one person in particular that I have had some relational struggles with for the past few years. We're in a great place now, but it took us some work to get there. So rewinding back a ways, um, this is a person I work with closely in a supportive role, but often felt misunderstood by her and taken for granted. I felt like she didn't respect my time and I did all I could to work ahead and stay a few steps ahead of her request so I could avoid her. I felt my defenses kick in every time she approached my desk and I knew I wasn't responding well to her and I didn't like how it felt, but I also didn't know what to do about it. One day she sent me an email and a less than 30 seconds is at my desk after I'd already replied to her email and I was just done. I was very over her hovering and just feeling critical of everything I did. So I snapped at her and the look on her face told me I had hurt her feelings. I knew I needed to apologize, but I also didn't want to because she had hurt me and I felt very justified in my response to her. But I also knew that the tension and the problem wasn't going to go away on its own. So I started walking across the hall to her office and I prayed on the way that Jesus would give me eyes to see her differently and to see her more like he does. I also prayed that he'd take care of us both in case it didn't go well. So I walked in and asked if I could talk to her and I apologized for responding to her harshly. She immediately teared up and said, I know I'm difficult and no one likes me. And then I started crying, which I do every time I tell the story. And if you know me, that's not a surprise. I told her I actually liked her very much, but I didn't understand her and I wasn't sure of how to interact with her in a way that felt helpful. So we awkwardly worked our, through, our way through a conversation about all the ways that we misunderstood each other and what things meant and didn't mean. And it was awkward, for sure, but it was good. As I was leaving her office, I thanked her for being willing, being willing to stick in it with me. And I said that I hoped I wouldn't, but I couldn't promise I wouldn't hurt her feelings again and that we need to have more conversations like this. She said the same and we agreed that we'd keep talking even if it was hard. Now, about a year and a half later, what used to feel like her rough edges to me now feel a little bit more like random quirks about her and are just part of who she is. She still pushes my buttons and we miss each other sometimes because we're super different, but we've continued to talk and engage when that happens. This is an example of bearing with, and it's humbling because I know she's bearing with me too, that I have qualities that frustrate her and people, and I am also in need of that grace from others. I need that to be extended to me as well. Bearing with is a mutual process, an admission that I am not always right and that I have something to learn from the other. Bearing with is also a value in the kingdom of God. While we are working to build the kingdom here and now, it is also not yet. We're still waiting for when Jesus will come and set all things right. And in the meantime, bearing within community is going to cause tension. First and foremost, we might feel some pretty strong cultural tension because American culture elevates and rewards independence and autonomy. 
It suggests we look at people in ways of what they offer us or what they bring to the table. And it suggests if they aren't meeting our needs or useful to us that we can drop them. That is not bearing with or recognizing the image of God in the other. As St. Benedict says, we must overcome the urge to run away. It is hard work to stick it out with another person in areas of difference, to just set aside your desires for a time for the good of another, or to choose to set aside your own agenda and truly listen to someone. Community is a tenacious commitment to stick with each other and be generous with each other because God has dealt so generously with us. But we don't have to muster the ability to bear with. Jesus and the Spirit do that work in us to make it possible. He's broken down the barriers that have separated us, and our practice of living together in community is a choosing to live into what Jesus has already done. As Jesus helps us to bear with, we might continue to hope that something about the other person changes, but we often find that something in or about us will change as well. Bearing within love is the full phrase from our text in Ephesians. And our second scripture passage from 1 Corinthians elaborates more what that kind of love looks like. This passage, probably in another translation, is really familiar to many of us and is commonly read at weddings as descriptive of marital love. It is actually written, however, to describe the love we are to have for each other in the context of Christian community. It immediately follows the passage describing the church as the body of Christ, where each member belongs and is essential for the well-being of the whole. We are enriched by the presence of each other, and in fact, we need each other. Together, we experience unity and oneness in Christ. Listen again to this passage from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's own achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame or disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. In Western culture, and even in the American church, we do not have much experience with sacrificial love, choosing another over ourselves, or interdependence outside the context of marriage or perhaps a nuclear family. This has felt really apparent to me during these pandemic times. People feel very justified in their opinions of what is and what is not safe and what they are willing to do or not do for someone else. There has been outcry that the things suggested or mandated for the common good are an infringement of personal freedom. This passage and much of the New Testament invites us to a more sacrificial, communal, and perhaps even familial love within the body of Christ. This type of love stands in stark contrast to what we see around us. It is costly love. Bearing with is difficult and gritty, and humility is required, but it is deep and strong too. Love always believes the best for others, and it does not give up. What might it be like if our community loved a little more like this? What might Community West Church look like if we were a community where people didn't write each other off, but truly listened to one another? What if Community West was a place where people approached each other with humility and curiosity instead of irritation or defensiveness? Could we become known as a place where people work together to eliminate barriers and seek the common good of their neighbors? Could we be a place where people respect each other and continue to engage in the midst of differences? What if ours was a community where it was safe to make mistakes? Where do-overs and trying again were not just possible, but became the norm? Maybe just maybe those moments of being uncomfortable or inconvenienced might begin to feel worthwhile. What a tangible way to show Christ to each other, and what an incredible way to know the love and generosity of God more if we were loved like that ourselves. Relying on Christ in us, we can learn and grow together as an interdependent community in this place. The welcome and belonging and grace we have received in Christ frees us to offer that to others. Living com in community helps us practice recognizing the spirit and image of God in the other and reveals the presence of God in our midst and to the world. Our love should look different and it should be attractive and compelling to our neighbors. While these strange pandemic times might be kind of a weird time to talk about community because we're so isolated. I think they are also full of opportunity for us to love those around us patiently, 
generously and with humility. I commend the liturgy of community to you. Community is a spiritual practice, a practice because we will do it over and over again. We will make mistakes and we'll try again. And we will learn and grow together as we do it again and again with Jesus enabling us to live into our calling, confident that he has already done the work to redeem us and make us one. Amen. Thank you.